Hi, everybody. My name is Jan David Ehrlich. I'm the Chief Operating Officer over here at Weights and Biases, and that means I am uh, get the honor to present our first State of ML Fully Connected report. And this one is for the year that just ended, 2022. Maybe before we start, given this is the first of such reports, we'll give you a little bit of a caveat on the methodology that we used over here uh, for this report. Uh, first off, it's based on an anonymized analysis of usage on the weights and biases, active user base, and the activity measured on our platform. Uh, a little bit of data in 2020, but most of it really in 2021 and 2022. You'll see the definition, you know, you'll see active user used throughout this report afterwards. And so uh, it's best to define what an active user is. And that is an individual that's performed some sort of activity on the weights and biases platform, whether logging a run or uh, performing a hyperparameter sweep or um, logging some versioned model data or, um, or uh, artifacts, et cetera. Uh, finally, uh, probably the biggest caveat is presence counts of frameworks and libraries. Uh, we're measuring that by looking at import statements in the Python training code. Uh, we are aware that this can overcount libraries that are imported, uh, but not used. Uh, none of you all do that, right? Uh, uh, and then finally, uh, ML training hours are measured wall clock time. Um, as opposed to processor strength or count adjusted. So just uh, factor that into the uh, results that you're going to see in a second. Let me start off with a, a brief uh, overview of 2022. So in, in 2022, we had a, a little bit over 200,000 active users, uh, as per the, the definition on the previous slide, uh, hailing from uh, almost 195 countries uh, and performing uh, nearly actually 125,000, um, or sorry, 125 million ML runs. Uh, so um, just to show that, you know, hopefully this data is going to be somewhat representative uh, given the statistical significance of the uh, sample set that we're using to, to do this report. Hopefully, I don't need to remind you what weights and biases does, but I'll spend a quick second doing that anyway. We are an end-to-end -end ML ops solution that enables ML practitioners uh, to train uh, their models uh, from definition all the way through production. We have a number of products, including experiment tracking, collaborative reports, artifacts that let you uh, version both your data sets and your models, interactive data visualizations with tables, we recently launched our uh, workflow uh, automation system launch, and then you can host weights and biases on a variety of cloud environments as well as on-premise, and uh, we integrate with thousands of frameworks and libraries, some of which we will discuss in this uh, State of ML report. And then we're, uh, we're also honored to be used by some of the world's leading ML teams across a broad basis of industries and use cases. Uh, and aside from a little bit of a humble brag with the slide, it, it hopefully uh, goes to show again that the data that we'll show over the next few slides is hopefully representative of the universe of research that is being performed in ML, uh, both in academia and in the corporate setting across uh, a broad base of, of research parameters, industries, use cases, and the like. So, uh, you know, without further ado, let's get into the let's get into the data. We'll cover three topics, uh, a little bit about the user demographics, uh, a bit on the frameworks and libraries that we see these users using in weights and biases, uh, and then finally a bit on hardware, predominantly in this analysis on, uh, on GPUs. So first, when we look at the demographics by country, uh, I think one of the things that you can notice straight out uh, from 2020 through 2022 is the rise of users in Asian countries. Uh, and that's not to say that Europe, particularly Western Europe, is not still strong uh, users of the platform, but you can see starting in 21, users in Asia, China, South Korea, Japan, really becoming ascendant as active users on the Weights and Biases platform. Obviously, the US is still leading in and across these years, but, but we see this, this big rise among the, the Asian countries. When you look uh, by profession, 
you see that usage in both academics and corporates continues to increase year on year, but we also see this acceleration in usage among personal users and hobbyists, which we think reflects the broader interest across the population in ML. And so we're seeing more of these kind of individual users trying out models, learning and getting exposure to ML, and that's being reflected in the, in the data that we see. And then finally, when you look at the corporate usage and slice it by industry, you'll notice first that this is a 100% chart. So all of these industries are, are growing year on year, but it's, it was quite interesting for us when we looked at it as a, you know, a total chart to see the increased growth in healthcare and life sciences. So high tech, as one would expect, dominates our user base. Uh, but you can see between 2020 and 2022 that the healthcare and life sciences uh, slice of this pie is growing a bit faster than the rest. And, and we found that interesting. Let's talk a little bit about frameworks. So first, let's start by talking about the, the two main core frameworks, TensorFlow and PyTorch. And uh, as you can see for our user base, uh, Torch uh, seems to be the preferred one and, and seems to be uh, accelerating its lead over, over TensorFlow. And that is true when we measure this across active users, across ML, the number of ML training runs, as well as the sum of the training hours spent uh, executing these, these runs. And you can see actually in the latter two, the ML runs and the training runs, that the acceleration seems to be steeper for PyTorch over TensorFlow than it is among active users. Uh, and so we did a further analysis to try to see whether um, Torch users just run longer runs. And it, and it does seem to be the case that, that Torch users seem to run uh, longer, slightly longer ML runs than uh, TensorFlow users. And that might indicate slightly larger networks or slightly uh, deeper runs or more training data or wherever we can, we can take it in, an, in any direction. Let's look a little bit at the uh, the higher order frameworks, uh, Keras versus Lightning. And I think the first thing that you'll notice is uh, among active users, uh, Keras is more widely used than Lightning. And that is the reverse of the Torch TensorFlow situation that we described earlier, which has us uh, hypothesizing that basically more TensorFlow users use it alongside Keras than Torch users might use alongside Lightning. But once you look at ML runs and training hours, you notice that the relative effects are the same. So basically Lightning is leading Keras uh, by ML runs and training hours uh, parallel to uh, its underlying core framework, so Torch uh, versus TensorFlow. And then finally, when you look at the uh, the boosted networks, uh, you uh, it's actually hard to, to make out you know who's leading or or whatnot. Kind of the the graphs seem to be you know di different leaders across different graphs. But one of the things that is uh, you know fairly clear is that you see more runs with uh, more and shorter training runs, basically, and that should be reflective of uh, the scalar. Uh, type of media types that uh, these frameworks are, are usually used to, to train. Finally, when you look at the split by profession, so comparing the usage of these frameworks by academics versus corporates, the first thing you notice is that, you know, Torch is, is widely used by uh, both sets, slightly more so by academics, and that gap is made up in the corporate realm by a slightly larger usage of all of the other frameworks. So TensorFlow, Keras, Lightning, XGBoost, et cetera. No one framework has really uh, significantly made up that, that little sliver of, of gap provided by, by Torch among corporates. But it is, Torch is, is, is the overwhelming favorite uh, for for both of these uh, of these category sets. Finally, when we look at the non-large framework libraries, uh, we wanted to see some of the fastest growers. And we did this actually uh, quarter over quarter. So looking at Q4 of 2022 versus Q3, because we really saw an ascendance in 2022 of this interest and an explosion of, of ML that year. And that is uh, proven out by the growth of some of these uh, smaller libraries over the course of, of those quarters, where you can see you know, growth rates uh, north of 3x, 2x, uh, and even among the, the larger libraries like Transformers and Hydra, you're still seeing growth rates uh, you know, well north of 1.5x. So uh, quite impressive acceleration in the usage of a broad base of libraries among the ML practitioners training runs and weights and biases 
particularly in the last year in 2022. Now, interestingly, uh, when you compare uh, the libraries by profession, uh, you don't see that many differences. So our corporate users and academic users uh, are broadly using the same ML libraries. Uh, and I think this is, again, probably a testament of the uh, fairly um, you know, blurry line between uh, both types of research. So academics uh, helping with corporate research and, and vice versa. And so they're, they're um, you know, essentially using the, the, the same uh, libraries to, to, to perform very similar type of, of research. Finally, uh, let's talk a little bit about hardware. And I think one of the things that probably should jump out at you pretty quickly on this GPU chart is how much it is dominated by NVIDIA. There's a little sliver of the new Apple M1, M2 processors. And then obviously there's some processors that, you know, we can't identify, but the, the overwhelming majority of the rest are NVIDIA processors. The other thing that we're, that we're seeing year on year is the ascendance of uh, the more powerful processors. Among the GeForce the set, the 1080s, 2080s are being uh, supplanted by 3080s and, and 4080s. And then obviously you see the, the triangle at the bottom, the, the rise of the, uh, of the A100, these very beefy GPUs that are used in, in data centers. And then when we look at uh, GPU counts, we notice that most of our users are still using single GPU environments. I think this is also a reflection of the broader adoption of ML. Not everyone can uh, necessarily afford these very beefy multi-GPU setups. But when you look by number of runs and by number of training hours, particularly by number of training hours, you see the ascendance of uh, these more clustered GPU environments. You know going up to nine plus and, and, and more uh, GPUs growing in percentage uh, of use. And so there is a subset of users that are training these very large models on very beefy environments. And as with all uh, first analyses, it begs for further analyses. And so uh, uh, we, we couldn't get done all of the analysis that we wanted to. And so we've left ourselves some topics for future state of ML reports. Um, in particular, we want to do some more work uh, analyzing CPUs, uh, Google's TPUs and graph cores, IPUs. Uh, we'd love to do some work analyzing on which clouds, whether Amazon, Google, Microsoft, or on-premise, our users are training their ML runs. Uh, and then obviously, uh, the industry data at the start of the deck has us curious uh, to do some more deeper analysis into the evolution of use cases and media types that are being used in the training of ML frameworks. This was really fun, so we uh, will do it again. So please look forward to future uh, state of ML reports from us at Weights and Biases. And uh, yeah, thank you again for your time. Mm -hmm.